last week we started speaking about uh, euthanasia and we define it very specifically having this intention uh, to end one's life looking at an action or remission of an action that causes death and specifically in cases where the patient is suffering is a high likelihood of death okay and so so far we've been talking about uh, physician assisted suicide which is legal in four states uh, in the United States today but let's complicate it a little bit let's talk about morphine I, th I, I don't know if we so we didn't get here right last week or we did oh okay um, so we don't need to go over it again uh, so real quick is morphine a form of phys physician assisted suicide um, Olivia you mind just telling me just a quick recap why it's a moral dilemma like what's the problem with this well I mean morphine because um as you increase the dosage, you also take the risk of suppressing one's respiratory function. And with increasing the dosage and eliminating their suffering, you do run the risk of killing that person, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So at least if you look at the consequences, and if you're in Oregon and you opt for physician-assisted suicide, the doctor injects you with this, you know, like this poison or medication that ends your life. In this instance, we have you know, a doctor or nurse injecting you with this poison or medication, which eventually ends your life. Are they morally equivalent? Okay, let's just show of hands. Raise your hand if you think they are morally equivalent. No one, really. Raise your hand if you think they are, they are not equivalent. Okay? Raise your hand if you're kind of in the middle. You're not sure yet. Okay. Uh, Francesca, what do you think? Why? Wait, what was the question? Do you, uh, um, do you think the use of morphine is physician assisted suicide? Uh, yes. Why? So the consequences are the same, right? Yeah. Kim, what do you think? This, this complicated you know, scenario has led to the development of uh, this theory right here, which is called a doctrinable effect. Has anyone seen this before, maybe in ethics class? Yeah. Yeah. Doctrinable effect, you seen it? Okay. You mind telling me what the context? Um, I was in an ethics class. It was um, like business ethics, like principles of business ethics. Okay. And um, we did it as a hospital study, like Cool, great, thank you. Um, so, how do you differentiate between the moral and immoral action, especially for people of religious faith who, who, are, who are making those statements that there are good and there are bad things, and, and, and many of us say, in terms of the legality of physician-assisted suicide, in this state it is illegal. Um, so how do you differentiate what is, um, the legal use of drugs that end life versus the illegal use of drugs? This is one way to do so. You look at, um, so the, there, there's four criterion for the doctrine of double effect. Let's go through them. So the, the context is the use of morphine. The act itself must be morally good or at least indifferent. Is using morphine morally good or at least indifferent? Morally indifferent. Yeah? Yeah? Raise your hand if you think the use of morphine is bad. Like you should not use morphine. Okay, most would say yes. We're going to pass that. Uh, the agent, in this case the nurse or doctor, must not positively will the bad effect, but may permit it. Is the nurse who's administering the morphine, is she willing that that person die? Right? What do you think? Um, yeah. Kelly, Kelly? Kelly Bauer, right? Kelly. I think for the most part, I mean, I'm sure there's an exception to everything, but I think for the most part when a nurse administers the morphine, her main intention is to just kind of help the person stay comfortable not kill them. In this state, if we find out that you're administering morphine to kill someone, like you're going to jail. A nurse or doctor, right? It, it's illegal. Uh, so we'll pass that. The good effect must be produced directly by the action, not the bad effect. Uh, the good effect of pain relief must be produced by the action, giving the morphine, not by the death itself. We say in this situation, yes, right? Because 
The goal is to relieve suffering, and that's what's happening. But your suffering is being relieved not by death, but by the use of morphine. Make sense? And then finally, the good effect, the relieving of suffering, must be sufficiently desirable to compensate for allowing the bad effect. Right? Uh, so in, in use of morphine, by the way, you know, we're talking about cases of terminally ill, people who are you know, in excruciating pain. Okay? We say in those situations where you're excruciating pain, absolutely. Uh, the good effect of relieving that pain does uh, justify uh, this um, consequence that ultimately will lead to your death. Okay, so we'll pass there. So this would be an example. And by the way, in terms of religious traditions, um, the vast majority of religious traditions that I discussed at the beginning, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. By Christianity, you know, specifically, you know, Catholicism. Uh, I think of, you know, Southern Baptist Church. Um, all the major traditions within this, within our country would say no to euthanasia, but yes to this. Okay. Well, and so we just talked about this. Okay, it will come down to the, to some extent, um, the intention of the nurse. And in most cases, the use of, uh, the use of morphine is simply to end suffering, which is a very good intention. Um, Let's complicate it some more. Brendan, 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 you're driving home today, right? And this happens, okay? Sorry, you're wrecked. But look at Brendan. You know, I see him at the gym a lot, right? You remember me? You, you don't know? You don't? You notice me? You honestly? I like we've gotten dressed next to each other. I like I've seen you in your underwear. You don't, you don't, no, you know? I'm making it off for okay. So anyway, um, we, we've been in the gym together. But I, I know you. I know you. Like you work out. You're you're a buff dude. He's a buff dude. Um, you're a healthy guy. Now he has a high likelihood because he's young. He's healthy. He has a will to live, right? Uh, to to survive this this car wreck. And so we'd say in this situation, it would be immoral for um, a nurse or a doctor to give you morphine to the point where it might end your life. Why? Because even though you might be in excruciating pain, um, that's not going to justify you know, death because you're going to heal. That's different than a case where someone who's terminally ill who is going to die regardless. Does that make sense? So in that situation, uh, because there's a high likelihood of survival, because he's a young, strapping, healthy fellow, um, it would not be ethical. And again, the good effect, it, it would fail number four. The good effect must be sufficiently desirable to compensate for the bad effect. The good effect of end suffering, in the case of someone who is going to heal, you know, because he's young and he's healthy, is not going to be, uh, is not going to compensate for the bad effect of, of his death. Okay? Simple? Make sense? Than euthanasia? Yes. Well, and frankly, there are many. Because it's still end of life. Like this example that you just gave was not an end of life situation. So that one doctor and his double effect failed. And yeah, that makes sense. But when it's the end of life of a patient and they're suffering, which it's the same thing to either make it quick or not. It's either they're going to spend weeks in the hospital and suck out money from the hospital or they're going to end it right there. And that should be up to them and whatever their moral, ethical values add up to. But I don't know why, I still don't, I don't agree, it doesn't apply. Okay, so you, you don't buy the logic, that's, no. and there are many in this country, because and there was a, the, the Pew Research did a study recently, I think it was 2013, of, uh, of this issue. And it's something like 46% of people in the US think euthanasia, or physicians to suicide specifically is immoral and should be illegal. Mm -hmm. We 4% you know, think it's absolutely I think ethical. it's a very fine line between the way we care for people now and the way we can, I mean, effortlessly care for them and let them die. And ergo, the moral dilemma of euthanasia, right? 
uh, created by um, the beauty of technology. Um, just to backtrack a second, so, so real quick, let's look at this guy. Who's this guy? Dr. Gabor King. Can someone tell me about him? What do you do? He people kill themselves. Yeah, right? But what's interesting about him, you know, he, he eventually uh, messed up and was caught. He knew the law very, very well. And he, he would do all kinds of stuff, like when he would be brought, when he was uh, brought up on trial for, for murder, you know, he would dress up like Dr. Death and get a little publicity. Uh, but he created this, you know, the, the death machine. And basically, he would create this machine, um, he would invite the patient, the terminal patient in, and would have them hook themselves up to it. He'd also give them a button. And so they would press the button when they so, you know, chose to press the button. When the authorities would come in to arrest him, Dr. Kevorkian would get off because he, he, he found that legal loophole. He never touched the patient. So he didn't kill. He just you know, set the person up for suicide, uh, which apparently isn't illegal to set someone up for uh, suicide. But in terms of uh, the, doc, the doctrine of double effect, I mean, this is a pretty easy case to see how it's immoral. Uh, number one, the act itself must be morally good or at least indifferent. Killing someone, especially from a Judeo-Christian perspective, which is the perspective of most Americans. Is that a good act? No, right? No? So, great. so they're saying what you're doing is illegal? Oh, it is illegal. So it still is illegal, except for in four states. But kids get bullied all the time and they kill themselves. So that's the same exact situation. That's a setup for suicide. Which, where are you going with that? I mean, certainly, I'm saying that I can't think of any person that would say that's, a, that's bad, too. Right? Yeah, but that's not what you're Bully is. To some extent, isn't it? And suicide is. Yeah, but I think he killed himself, but he was leaving the privacy and bring him up behind and bullied him. The way I see this is that. Actually, I think there is bullying laws now. Yes, that kid who um, Rutgers, or that kid who jumped off the bridge because he was bullied for being gay, and then his roommate was brought up in charges for that. I think he was. I'm not sure if he was convicted, but he's definitely on trial for the death of his roommate. Yeah. And the way I see this is like, it's like a psychiatrist telling you to go kill yourself because you're suicidal. That's the way I see this guy. This guy? Yeah. Work him. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because, I mean, he's, he's here, he claims himself as a doctor, gives you all the background of like, hey, yeah, this is your diagnosis and this is how we can help you. You want to die? Here you go. Press this button. It's like a psychiatrist saying, yeah, you're, you know, you have whatever depression or whatever the case may be, <coughs> this is what you can do and just kill yourself. Like here. Here you go. Here's a gun or something like that. I think it's unprofessional. Um, and, and most thought so as well too. Yeah. I mean, even those who, who are proponents of euthanasia, uh, they generally don't uh, bring Dr. Warkin into the conversation. Uh, but just real quick in terms of Dr. Double Effect, this is going to fail the, the first three. Uh, because he's, he's killing a person, he's setting them up for death, uh, which is not a, not a good thing, which is illegal. Well, actually, um, it is not a, for, especially from a Judeo-Christian perspective, is it moral? Uh, the agent must not positively will the bad effect, but we permit it, you know, killing someone's a bad effect, and he's clearly willing it. And the good effect must uh, be produced directly uh, by the action, not the bad effect. In this case, the good effect of ending suffering is produced by killing the person uh, versus giving them uh, a palliative care. You would actually pass the fourth. Okay. Um, so what do you do then with, so we, we're looking at physician assisted suicide. We're looking at kind of a, a, a murky area, like the use of morphine, and we decided that's, that's ethical. But then what do you do with what happens in this country uh, with most people today? Sometimes this is called passive euthanasia. Personally, I don't like using those terms because I think it's confusing. Um, but the issue of withholding or withdrawing life support. Okay. Is it physician-assisted suicide to pull the plug on a terminally ill patient? We'll stick a poll real fast. Raise your hand if you think it is physician-assisted suicide to pull the plug on a terminally ill patient. But if you don't feel the same way about withholding or withdrawing, yeah, I mean, say important. say I come into the emergency room, I have a DNR, I have a clock, I have. Uh, DNR. Something saying, uh, I have a tattoo on my chest saying no code. Don't run a code on me. Yeah. It, I feel like that's different from pulling the plug on someone who's already had, like maybe didn't have documentation, has already been put on. 
life sustaining equipment. Yeah, I think there needs to be specifications. Yeah, I don't think there's the same. Well, there's certainly there is. Certainly, we'll we actually won't get into too much. But you, but you're right, and, and I think some would say, at least from the Christian perspective, many Christians would say DNRs are perfectly um, <coughs> moral. Mm -hmm. However, there are circumstances where they wouldn't be moral. Um, you know, going back to like you know Brendan's case. Many Christians would have a problem if Brendan's in the car accident. He has a high chance of, high likelihood of um, living, but he has a DNR, right? And so um, the doctors who are in his care decide we're not going to resuscitate him because he has a DNR. That would cause a moral, that, that, that would cause a, a serious dilemma for a Christian. But isn't a DNR just a prescribed form of euthanasia? It's a, it's a pre written form of euthanasia? It, dep it depends how you're defining euthanasia. The way I've defined it here, and I specifically define it specifically, specifically define it uh, with intentionality. So their intention is to die with it. Hold on. So I if you use that definition, then it would depend upon the circumstance. Well, because the DNR has to be signed off by a physician. Mm -hmm. So it's just, so a physician is assisting them in killing them. But the DNR, in the terms of a physician assisted suicide, let's take in Vermont. Like the physician is actively injecting you with a medication that ends your life. Here, the physician is saying that in certain circumstances, and we'll, we'll look at a DNR form a little later on. Uh, so just indirect. We're withholding. This is saying you're withholding uh, <coughs> care. That's different than pur purposefully injecting you with a poison to end your life. But he's indirectly uh, assisting you. Well, not even that, because the doctor's saying that you don't need the care. The doctor himself is not. Is, is he, he, one doctor signing off saying that if another medical professional finds you in the state, they shouldn't resuscitate you. They shouldn't give you CPR, right? Uh, mouth to mouth, whatever. That's different than that doctor not giving you mouth to mouth or CPR. But wouldn't this apply to the first guy, the first video we watched of him on his ventilator? What about it? Like somehow, like, is, is it possible that you can sign a do not resuscitate order when you're on a ventilator? I don't think so. Or like, do not intubate? I don't know. Can Wait. you do that? Can you do that when you're like, verbally? <laughs> yeah, verbally when you're <laughs> intubated? I know. Yeah, I, I think it depends upon the circumstance, but certainly I've seen, I've known, I've been in hospitals where there have been, um, there was a specific person um, that was in the hospital for a very long time and he was on a ventilator, and he decided, he wrote up a living will, and he decided that uh, this was an extraordinary means. And he was actually was a faithful Catholic, so he, he was doing this with you know, his, his faith tradition. And he decided this was an extraordinary means, and that he would <coughs> take it off and put himself into you know, God's hands, and he did, and he died. So that was legal, and in terms of the Catholic position, that was seen as moral. And that would be an example of withdrawing uh, life support. Um, so let's look. So one of the, and we've, we've touched upon it, one of the, the biggest moral dilemmas that we've seen, we'll talk about the two cases just popped up in the past few months, one in California, other in Texas. Uh, this issue of a, pers a persistent vegetative state. And, and it usually is, you know, you're, you're in a state where uh, you're, you're, you know, some kind of brain dead or, or very low brain activity and you're just laying there and you're being kept alive by these machines, right? <laughs> Ventilators, whatever else. Can you take it off? Uh, for many Christians and for many people, forget about Christians, people in general, the issue will be, are these treatments burdensome or useful or useless? And even in terms of the state, in terms of the state intervention, we'll talk about some cases where the state has intervened. Um, if it's burdensome or useless, you know, the state, well, we'll get to the case of Terry Shiva, where in the case of Terry Shaw, the state deemed her care was burdensome and useless, and so they took her off it. Um, but again, the issue will be intention. We're talking a lot about intention. How do you know what your intention is? Right? I mean, what is your intention for being here? Let's take something easy. What is your intention for being here? I'm sorry, what is your name again? Ashley, 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 what is your intention for being here? Like this class? Yes. Cool. This class. <laughs> you need a religion class, right? You know, but there are many religion classes, right? It, it, it fits your schedule. It fits your schedule, so you have two intentions. Um, you know, you, you may have a remote interest in death and dying. 
Maybe you're morbidly like, no, not at all. No, <laughs> you need a religious class and it fit your schedule. So you have you have two you have two intentions there. You know, how do you find out what is like the intention? In every action you have, there's usually one uh, motivating intention. Uh, and so when we look at the issue of taking someone off life support, what is your true intention? And an easy way to figure this out is to create your in your mind a scenario. <coughs> you take the person off life support, right? And they have one of those one in a million miracles. They sit up and they're fine. How do you respond, right? Do you grab their pillow and try to suffocate them? You know, uh, or, or are you happy? Like you, you rejoice because you know they they've been saved or whatever. They're they're alive. Um, if your action is the first, you know, if, if you act in the in the in the in the, uh, in the first way where you're unhappy about them being healed, then your intention was wasn't very good. Uh, whereas you, you're probably not a good person, um, but if it's the second way, when you when you have joy, pull, and when you're jo when you have joy, well, then your intention isn't for them to die. Your intention is them for them to live, and, and you let nature take its course, so to speak. Um, I thought this was pretty cool. This was uh, on uh, NBC, and this is one of those cases where the where the uh, mother took her daughter off, um, which she deemed to be a burdensome treatment. <laughs> Angels, well, according to some polls, three quarters of Americans do. But if you're among the skeptics, you might want to change your mind when you see this next story. Here's NBC's Ron Mott. NBC. Colleen Benton didn't expect her disabled daughter Chelsea to see her 15th birthday. Well, she's now the gift of the season for this family. There's seven, can you count them? A family counting its every blessing. We've been praying for a miracle. And, um, I think this is the beginning of it. Back in September, pneumonia had pushed Chelsea toward death's door in a Charlotte hospital. Here she is with big sister Kaylee, who thought she was saying her final goodbyes. Yet an hour after life support was removed, jaws began to drop among some hospital workers over what appeared at another door near the teenager's room. And this image appeared up on the security monitor. And uh, it was an image of an angel. And um, I thought, well, either that's the angel coming to uh, take her to heaven, or it's an angel to say that she's getting better. And she got better all right, almost immediately, Mom says. And the doctors and the nurses were all amazed. The mother took this cell phone picture of the image, bright bands of light only visible on the hospital security monitor. The hospital confirms that some of its workers told the family they saw something as well. It's a blessing. It's a miracle, and um, I'm learning not to take things for granted. It's an emotional story to tell, and just off camera, Chelsea herself begins to cry at the sight of her mom breaking up. Please don't cry. <laughs> it's okay. And the point being that you could tell, so her intention, they took her daughter off life support, which they deemed to be burdensome given her condition. This is one of those rare instances where uh, she was healed and how did the mother respond Very she was yeah she is a miracle right um, mm -hmm. we would say that her intention wasn't for her daughter to die her intention was you know for uh, to to end her suffering um, uh, to let you know nature take its course um, what do you think about that do you believe in angels now <laughs> death angels, death angels. <laughs> um, pretty cool though all right, so what is a burdensome treatment? This, this is important. This is the, how do you differentiate what is burdensome from you know, what is ordinary required? By the way, so burdensome treatments, I think you know, down the line, especially when we're, this is a religion class, we're uh, looking at religious perspectives. Um, religions, uh, religious leaders, religious traditions would say, you're not required to undergo extraordinary means. They're kind of like indifferent. Maybe immoral, but, but generally speaking, at, at least indifferent. Um, and extraordinary means is something, is a treatment that's futile, futile. Um, not worthwhile since the patient has a reason to think that he or she can, has no longer an obligation to prolong their life. Uh, the burden is not warranted by the promised you know, benefits. Um, you know, so think about you're in a situation where they say, well, if you go through the surgery, you might have, this might add, this painful surgery, this might add, you know, 
a month onto your life. That's, that's not a, a great, uh, you shouldn't be obliged to go through a surgery that only has a month. Or think about this way, there, there, there's a, you have a, you have a family member that's dying, and the doctor says, well, he or she can go through this therapy. If they go through this therapy, there's a 5% you know, um, chance that they'll survive, that they, they will survive. But if you want to go through, after going through all this other stuff, you want to spend all this money, all this time, all this energy, go through extra suffering for a 5% chance of survival or you know, getting better. Um, no, that, that, that would be a, a burdensome treatment. Now, if you did do that, and by the way, there are some people that are known as vitalists. A vitalist, think of someone like Larry King. A vitalist is someone that says, you, know, you do everything possible to keep me alive, right? When, when the, the Terry Shavell case broke out, I remember Larry King going on Nash TV and saying, I want to go on the record. You do everything to keep me alive, right? So if I'm in a vegetative state, you pump my heart as long as you possibly can in hopes that some doctor somewhere will uh, invent something to make my brain work again, right? I mean, there are people like that. Uh, most in this country, and in terms of religious traditions, uh, aren't on that same boat, so they're not vitalists. <laughs> now, one of the challenges is you have to examine it case by case, and so there, there is a universal um, laws here. Yes? I, um, with the first definition or thing for um, extraordinary, extraordinary treatments, when it says not worthwhile since the patient has reason to think that she no longer has an obligation to prolong her life, I, I guess I just don't understand that wording. Like, what what would be considered an obligation to prolong their life? Like, you know, if they die or family. just nobody wants them around or pregnancy? Yeah, because I think that would be an obligation. What is it? An obligation for, to have an obligation to prolong your life could possibly be a pregnancy. Other than that, to not have an obligation to prolong your life, how do you know if you're vegetative? I think that's very. And we're, by the way, we're not we're simply speaking about vegetative states. That's, that's usually the case. You know, it, it, it might be, um, you know, more chemotherapy, and you might just opt not to go through it because you know that you, know, you, you personally don't feel obliged to do this because, like, let's say you spent the last two years going through chemotherapy and it hasn't done anything. You know, doctors are saying, well, let's do another round of chemotherapy. And, and any one of you that knows someone or has gone through chemotherapy, you know the toll it takes. You know, you lose your hair. And it, it's all kinds of stuff. It, it's, not, it's not fun by any means. And they say, I don't feel obliged to do this. This would cover them in that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they spend all this time doing it right. They should be obliged to keep going. There's a point where you, you can say, if enough is enough. Enough is enough. But now it's difficult to make the decision, though. Uh, now these aren't ordinary treatments. Now, so what's an ordinary treatment? Now, this is where we get a little bit, it gets a little hairy. Um, they're commonly considered ordinary for the basic preservation of human life. Um, usually food and shelter, you know, hydration, right? it's just the very, very basic things. In some cases, you know, um, so let's go back to, to uh, Brendan's case where, you know, where he's in a car wreck. And he, and he, life support, in this situation would be an ordinary means, right? Because he has a high likelihood of survival. Um, you know, where, whereas in Brian, Brian, who happens to be 95 years old, who spent the last, you know, two years struggling with a certain disease, uh, life support would not be obliged to Brian. And so uh, ordinary means may never be taken away. And even in terms of um, legal issues, in terms of state law. Um, that's murder if we take away someone's ordinary means. We'll, we'll, we'll get into some. Now, now let's get into the, the Harry case studies. Uh, the first case study is Terry Shiloh. Okay, so, so Terry Shiloh, again, we're looking at withholding uh, life sustaining treatments. And so the debate is not position as a suicide, injecting her with a poison. The debate is. <laughs> Can we take away these treatments that are keeping her alive? Can someone tell me about Terry Schiavo? Most of you look pretty young, so do you guys remember her? 2005, uh, how old are you? Like in middle school? Right? High school, okay, high school, sorry, high school, high school. So what happened? Can we tell me a basic gist? Yeah. Christine, right? Yeah. 
she like she just dropped they don't know if her heart I think it was her heart, right? That one. And they don't know if she had an eating disorder before too, I think, that just supposedly triggered it. But she was basically kept alive for decades while they were fighting the courts. Her husband wanted the life sustaining treatment to end, but her family didn't. Because mm -hmm. they said that she was showing signs of life. Do you remember what exactly the life sustaining treatment was? So what happened is, um, she was she, trauma occurs. We don't know. Of course, you know. The, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say of course. I don't want to be pejorative, but the parents suggest that she was a victim of domestic of domestic violence. Um, and her husband. We don't know. She came to the hospital in a persistent vegetative. Well. She came to the hospital all bruised up. Doctors also made some mistakes, so she wind up she winds up in a persistent vegetative state. Where she goes from this, you know, to this. Um, husband's around for a while, then he takes off, he leaves her with the parents, goes off to Pennsylvania, starts his own life, new, uh, new girlfriend, children. You know, he, he has a job, whatever. Moves on. One day he comes back and says, "You know what? And by the way, she's in Florida. Um, this is enough." Terry Schiavo, my wife, would not want to undergo, would not want to live like this in this persistent vegetative state. So he, he gets into this legal battle with the family, eventually the state gets involved, and the state says the husband's right. And the state winds up taking away her hydration, and her IV, and her feeding tube, which results in her death you know, after two weeks. Um, they actually put a, a police man or security guy, I think it was a policeman, near her bedside to prevent her family from feeding her or giving her liquids. Okay. Did the state of Florida kill her? Ordinary means. Yeah. So if you say food and water ordinary means, then absolutely then the state of Florida killed her, right? Do how many of us agree? State of Florida killed her. Yeah, I wouldn't say that the state actually. It, it took away our food and water, right? If those are ordinary means. If you're saying food and water ordinary means, they basically started her to death. Yeah, which I feel like <coughs> means she wouldn't have been. Uh, I guess she, uh, she wouldn't have been living in a sense, anyways, if she wasn't on life support. But if, I think, well, you're food and water, you're going to die if you lose. Right? How many of us agree? Raise your hand if you think the state of Florida murdered Terry Shadow. Okay, so one, two, three, oh. four, five. <coughs> okay. 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 There's yeah. a question that would go along with that. <coughs> Abby just said, could you say that it was her husband? Because if, if it wasn't possibly if it wasn't presented to the state, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, you can, you can... Okay, so let's say the husband. The husband. Blame it on the state. Let's be more specific. The husband killed her. <laughs> we don't know that for sure. Yeah. But uh, of course, you know, one of the problems, and, and frankly, at least whenever I teach this, a lot of females in the room uh, bring up is the fact that the husband who is probably, uh, he's probably abusive to his wife, not only abused his wife and got away with it, but he made a profit and he wound up killing her. Yeah, she probably farmed his dreams. She probably has. Probably going nuts about <laughs> it. Hey, it. Anyone else? It was overwhelming. What do you think? What is your name? Michaela. 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 Yeah. Um, I don't really know. I feel like there should have been more done about her husband. I just, I don't know. I feel like <coughs> something was going on. And someone said that she had an eating disorder or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I just feel like that combined with the bruises coming in, and I don't know, it just all seems really weird to me. I don't know, if, I don't know, I don't think the state should be blamed for killing her though. Should the husband? Maybe. <laughs> More than the state, I guess. Yeah. Well, if there were accusations that he, um, that was domestic violence, then it just, it's interesting how, like, legal documents of his marriage can outweigh a blood relation to her. So if the husband was able to outweigh it, and if the husband had left, of course we'd want to take her off because in the event that she wakes up, she could testify <coughs> against him. So I think that the state should have taken that into consideration and maybe like given the right 
the family. Yeah, did you see it was how many years later that she was in this? Yeah, I, the number escapes, but it was it was significant. It was yeah. like about. <laughs> So what do you mean? Well, I'm, I mean, I feel like if the husband was worried about that, would done sooner. Yeah. Well, in the husband's defense, he said, like his argument was, you know, <coughs> you've been doing this for all these years. She's not getting better. She's being. She said, you're, you know, you're holding my wife in a sense of ransom as a vegetable. Let her die. Right? Yeah. For argument's sake, I think he won over the state of Florida by, like, presenting some sort of. You know, currency of how much this woman was costing the state. In for an alternative, I think the state should have gave the parents legal ability to take her home, artificially hydrate her, and artificially feed her because it's not that hard, and get some home care happening. <laughs> I think there could have been an alternative yeah. action rather than just letting her die. I mean, to go into the point where you aren't letting someone at her bedside to feed her is a little ex extraordinary and inhumane. I think there should have been an alternate option. But I think what made the decision was the money that was getting sucked out of the state. Yeah. Usually what control Plus in the fact that, legally speaking, certainly in the state of Florida, and I'm assuming the state of New York as well, once you're married, you know, the person who has the legal <laughs> rights to you, if you don't have a living will, or it's your husband, or your wife, not your parents. And so they were in, the state of Florida wasn't in, wasn't in the wrong for, okay, maybe they were in the wrong if they followed his, you know, uh, a bad opinion, but they were just following the law. The law doesn't allow for those nuances. Um, real quick, yeah. So if they were in favor of this, they ultimately wanted to kill her, I guess, or, or yeah. they wanted to end her life. Why let her starve to death and dehydrate? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Why, yeah, why, why Cause euthanasia is illegal in the that's state of Florida. That's not in favor. That's like a slow. I feel like there is that is or why. Because this is the key. Legally speaking, it's not illegal to take away an extraordinary means. So the state of Florida is saying that we didn't do anything illegal. We didn't murder her. We let nature take its course because she was brain dead, and we took away an extraordinary means. That's why that distinction is very, very important. Now, for many, including her family, they're saying no. Actually, Pope John Paul II, who was dying at the same time, <laughs> jumped in and said. This is an ordinary means of killing her, or you killed her. Can you just toss ordinary treatments with food, water, and shelter? Yeah. Just no, I said normally that's how it's presented as. The problem, as you could see from the definitions that I gave you, um, it's, 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 situation, it's, it's, it's situational, right? So there's some cases where life support is absolutely ordinary, like when you were, like when you were in your car wreck. Um, so, so drive carefully today. I don't want to, you know. <laughs> I feel really horrible if something happened to you after I talk about it. Um, but generally speaking, food and water is just like the basics. Now, two, two more cases, real quick. Did I cut you off? No, uh, that's First case, California. So what do you think about this? We'll, we'll do a poll in a second. Um, little girl, 13 years old, goes in for, uh, you know, basically have her tonsils removed, right? She didn't want to go in. Right, and the doctor and the parents talked her into going. Okay, something horrible happens. The girl winds up brain dead. Okay, parents, very religious people, um, they want to keep her alive as long as possible. At the very least, in hopes that God will <coughs> heal her. Doctors in the hospital are saying your daughter's brain dead. We need to take her off life support. Right. Legal issue ensues, and eventually, uh, this a lot happened, but eventually the state of California steps in and says to the hospital, you cannot take her off life support. Because uh, this, this is what the parents, even though just about all the doctors there are saying she's brain dead, she will not uh, be healed, she will not get better, you cannot take her off life support. Okay. How many of you think the hospital was immoral? trying to take her off life support. And again, what they're arguing is life support, in the case of this girl who is clearly brain dead, there's no brain function, uh, this is an extraordinary means. You're taking up a bed, you're sucking out money, um, you're sucking out time and energy to care for this young woman that is dead, or it can be used to care for you know, people that, poor, poor Brendan who was just in a car accident, who needs a bed. How do you think 
the hospital was immoral. Raging I think the hospital was immoral. Okay. Okay. Raging I think the hospital was completely making was moral, <coughs> made the right decision. Hands up high. Hands up high. Can you raise your hand if you're kind of in the middle? Who thinks that parents are unreasonable? Parents are unreasonable. Really? I don't know what it has to do with Abby, it's morality. They talked their daughter. We didn't want to get this surgery. Yeah, now they feel guilty and want to keep her alive. That's very selfish. And to perform a miracle like that, I'm sorry, I don't really believe like that. It's a little realist theory. I just think it's so interesting that religious people like are willing to like, call upon all the medical, uh, I guess, procedures and uh, tech, uh, technology that we have. And it's just like, what about before we had um, like intubation and whatnot? And then what about 100 years from now? It's like technology will be even more advanced. So I just don't understand how it's fair now because in the future maybe it just. I just can't, I just don't understand how religious people can even think medical intervention is okay. Because that, that's well, going against Catholic. To be, to be just, just to qualify that, some religious people can agree with you. And they would say, there have been cases, <coughs> actually the state has stepped in where we've had parents, who because of their religious tradition, have said, you know what, I don't want my child who has cancer to go through chemotherapy. If God wants to save her, God will save her. And they completely agree with you. Um, and in those situations, the state actually stepped in and said, "Sorry about your religious beliefs, but if you don't, you're, you're going to kill your kid, right?" Um, but there are others, primarily you know Catholics, who, who say who have this whole theory of synergy, and, and basically it's God works through all of us, right? <coughs> so God works through the doctors or the, or the nurses. That, that's not contrary to God's will. I wish that we. But anyway, I wish that we could pass a law that. At the age of 18 is the only time you could start practicing religion. And until then, you can, like, because how can... Try de try denying a kid who his parents are Jehovah's Witness a blood transfusion that's going to save his life, and you can't give it to him. So I think until the age of 18, they should be exempt from all religious stuff. And then The only thing is you have to be careful there for a variety of reasons. One of which is religious people are very happy about that. Uh, number, number, for a variety of reasons there. Number two is the state... In terms of children, I, on many occasions has, has, has stepped in and has created all kinds of dilemmas. So, so there, there, are, there is some legal precedent for the state stepping in but when there's a conflict like, between medical care and religion. But in an imminent situation like the blood transfusion, it's like you don't have time to get the state involved. And I, you know, at the age of 18, the kids should be able to choose, kind of like how you can choose what parent you want to live with if your parents get divorced. Yeah. Or if you want to know when the army. Yeah, so. I think it's a double-edged sword with the either intervention of highly like artificial hydration intravenous fluids. I think that denying that in a Catholic perspective may be equally as immoral as in allowing everything you can under the sun to save your life. I think it's a double-edged sword. I think it's sure. hard to just yeah. Uh, just like you said, if this is the intention, like the intention is to keep their daughter alive, and you know, after a certain amount of time, I mean, to, just to get things started, to put, the, put her on life support, after a certain amount of time, after maybe they feel like resources are being used, if she comes back from the, you know, life-saving proce procedures that have been done, and they're happy, then the intention was for her to live. I mean, I think that the, the moral dilemma all, always comes back to what was the intention? What was your, are you conscious of your intention? You know, like, do you know what you're doing? And that's like moral theology in Catholicism. It's like, do you know it's a sin? This is, you, this is it yeah, it's being applied. Look. Um, so let's take the second case. The second case real quick happened in Texas. <coughs> By the way, in terms of Catholic moral theology, it's just interesting to know that Certainly, I, I think most people would agree with me that parents have a right to do what they want. Uh, but there isn't, I can't think of any Catholic theologian that would say that it was immoral to take the daughter off life support. In, in this case, that, that's a clear, clear example. If you're brain dead, it, you know, uh, life support in that case is an extraordinary means. Um, although that may not be too comforting to a parent that had brought their child in for a routine surgery and now has to deal with their 
you know, making this call. It's very difficult for any parent. Would it be immoral for them to go on to life support? Huh? Would it be immoral for her to go on the life support? To continue on life support? To go on the life support. I mean, you're saying that they had this procedure done, and at first, absolutely not, because there was there was a reasonable hope of, okay, you know, success. But once it's prolonged, when there's no hope of success, then it's. How much you feel like Nancy? Is there the worst <coughs> parent in the world. <laughs> I think yeah, you're, you're not a parent yet, so. <laughs> well, you're not. Yeah, I know. You have to talk to the moms. Don't be a bad. Get, get, get. Mom, what do you think? <laughs> My mom would never. Huh? Like it. Well, you're the authority. You're your mom. What do you think about this issue? I. There you go. It's tough, though. I I, actually, I, I don't want to make you think about it. I'm not very superstitious, but just in the sense that, I don't know, if the kid really doesn't want something, I don't force it on them. And if, if she didn't really want that, unless it was because she kept getting struck for over and it had to be that day, but if the kid really didn't want it that day, I wouldn't have paid them. Because it, it, it'd be different if they don't want to go to school repeatedly, repeatedly, but if they're just a certain, I don't know, I think you really should listen to the kids if they don't want something. To a certain extent, yeah. I mean, when you your father, you have a child that's constantly getting a sore throat, crying, waking up little night. Yes, I know. And you'll, 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 we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how you feel about that. We'll, I know what it's like. Then. Know. Second case, Texas. Um, young couple married, uh, mother, wife, traumatic event, brain dead now. Happens to be 16 weeks pregnant. In the state of Texas, you cannot take someone off life support if they're pregnant because it will result in the death of the child. Complicating matters, husband steps in and says, you know what, my wife would want life support to be taken off. She would not want to be living in the state. So the state of Texas um, would not take her off life support and she was allowed, or I guess the child in her womb was allowed to grow to full term. I mean, and apparently they gave, they, she gave birth by a C-section to this, to this child. And afterwards, life support was taken off and the wife was and wife slash mother was allowed to die. Is that sick? I just incubated a kid in a dead body. I thought that although the, I would I thought that the, the fetus didn't survive. Like sixteen weeks they brought it to twenty two weeks and at twenty two weeks it came to pass that the mother wasn't gonna survive. Like there obviously mm -hmm. the fetus just couldn't survive either. So they decided, you know, the family ended up winning just like this happened like just a few weeks ago. Yeah. So what I thought too. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, let, let's take the situation where it's <coughs> for her. Okay. Make it, that's a little easier. Uh, and that was the intention to bring the child <coughs> to full term. Did the husband want her? The husband did not want his wife to remain on life support. So my question is, couldn't the husband just take her to the state? Legally, yes. I, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I, I think it might be a little more complicated. Did you say the cause was again? Huh? I don't. I don't remember the exact cause. Because the whole matter. Collapsed. Sorry, I was like really fascinated by this. Yeah, I was like on NPR and listening to it, but I don't know. I guess she didn't even know she was pregnant. Yeah, like at the time, she had no idea. So I guess in that way, it's hard to say whether or not, like the husband, yeah, it's like she wouldn't want to live here. But you know, what if they never discussed if she were to be pregnant? Also, like, who discusses that, right? I mean. Well, now we do. If I'm not going <laughs> and I have so to discuss it with your husband. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think that the mother would have wanted her child to be born. I think, like, I don't think, <coughs> I think she would have made an exception to her, like, belief about not being on life support in that case. Like, I don't know, if I was pregnant and I went on life support, I probably just would have wanted my child to be born. To live, like, if I'm the case, yeah. if I don't want to live, by that means, I don't think I would want to take someone else with me. How do you tell your kid that? How do you yeah. tell your kid that? I don't know. I thought there was like issues with um, that the baby was going to have problems if it did survive. And then like I just thought the husband just lost his wife, and now he's going to have a child that has a lot of issues. And he had to deal with all that. I just felt like that would be like way too much for him. And like I respected him for trying to get her off life support. I think that's crazy. Well, I have two points. 
first off, um, it's very, it's really expensive to do this because when you're brain dead, you can't regulate your body temperature, you can't regulate your hormones. So all this stuff needs to be done for a mom. And then just so much stuff to, and then uh, also, then dad has to be a single dad. And I don't know what <coughs> I would do if I would be able to remarry, but what if he does want to remarry and now he has a kid? I mean, and I know that sounds <coughs> bad and selfish, but at the same time, he's, I don't know. He's a legal advocate. So he is being forced to become a single father who's now, is he a widow? What are men? Widower. Okay, and then <laughs> this just complicates him never being able to recover from this. But, I don't know. Do you think that the child come out with disability? Or not? Could die. It just wasn't a sustainable fetus. Just because they can't. Uh -huh. It's very complicated. Yeah. So you bring that to Sorry. Shut your cell phones off. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> no, it just came with the phone. <laughs> I'm not that technologically savvy. Um, so, any other questions or comments on those issues? Yeah. Uh, I, I remember, like, remember the first day of class, we were saying like how we would want to die, and there were a couple people that said like something heroic or something like for a greater mm -hmm. we talked about like the greater cause I mean I don't you can, obviously you can't like talk to someone who's brain dead but that's like the great like in not and not taking totally taking her husband out of it which is which is hard to do because there's a legal connection there but um, do you think like the greater the greater good would be for that body to be kept I don't know like I think that's heroic I mean even it, it would, you know, it, like I said, it's hard to, to separate the husband from it, but yeah, yeah. the efforts are heroic, I think. Great. Thank you. Okay, so more moral dilemmas. I mean, who would have thought that incubating a child in a, in a brain-dead body would be possible? Like, I didn't, I didn't even thought about that being possible until, um, you know, this moral dilemma came up. So look at all these issues that, that technology brings. So technology is a very good thing, but it also brings up these uh, ethical dilemmas that we don't have clear answers for and there are attempts to kind of understand them. Okay. Now let's responsible? I, I don't know. I then I'm assuming it, so then how can the parents make it yeah. the state makes it that the state's forcing him to take all this debt on and also be a single Now granted we, I'm sure he had insurance so maybe that's not totally the case. I don't know. Oh yes. I think Good point. scared about how the baby comes out just growing in a vegetative body. I mean they talk so much about how mothers should interact with the baby and how important so what happens to music and stuff where I just don't have not only health problems but who knows the psychological yeah. about that. So and, and last point. Was um were they, were they religious at all? Were they Christian? Were they I don't know. I know he sued the hospital for like mutilation of his wife's body or desecration of a body. I'm not sure if it was entirely religious. I think it was more so just extraordinary yeah. means. You know? I mean, if they were, you could argue, you know, that it's against the, you know, you say the will of God, you know, God's plan, whatnot. I mean, you're keeping the baby alive. That yeah. it's like a form of abortion, too. Yeah. Well, you gotta, it gets, it gets, it gets really complicated because yeah, technically, yeah. <laughs> taking her off life support would be indirect abortion. And then, the, and then the, even within a, a, a you know, Catholics are strong, staunchly against abortion. Even within a Catholic perspective, indirect abortions are justified. So you might want to make the case that taking her off life support could be moral, and it wouldn't be even even if even if it indirectly results in the death of the child. Uh, but but anyway, that's that's something for you to consider, and just just to make you aware of these ethical issues today. Um, so let's talk about hospice quickly. And so the so the uh, the flip side of the coin. Uh, is hospice care. I just want to introduce you to it. I know many of you um, will be examining this in detail in terms of your papers uh, slash presentation. And so hospice is a philosophy for caring for the dying persons and their families. I'll just make a note. Uh, at the center of hospice is the belief that each of us has the right to die in a pain-free, with dignity, and that our families will receive the necessary support to allow us to do so. They focus on caring, uh, not curing. Um, one of the reasons why we don't see hospice involved uh, in, with physicians of suicide in states like Vermont, Montana, Washington, and uh, Oregon 
because of their mission. It's not within their mission to uh, help you die, right? Or make you comfortable, or to make you comfortable during the dying, or during the uh, killing process, the, the injection of the poison. It's them for the, to help you with the dying process uh, in general, uh, to come to terms with it, to make you more active in that process. Um, this came up in the last class, I just wanted to address it. So do you need to sign a DNR to be in hospice? No, it's a myth. You do not need to sign a DNR uh, to be in hospice or a living will. Certainly encouraged that you consider these questions. A part of hospice is make you consider these, these difficult questions. Uh, or at the very least, to put someone that you feel comfortable with in charge of uh, you so that when these questions come up, they are able to speak for you. And by the way, uh, DNR means do not resuscitate, and it primarily refers to uh, CPR. And, and CPR, again, uh, it was, um, refers to medical procedures that are used to restart the patient's heart and breathing and when the patient suffers heart failure. These can include mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, uh, external chest compression, electric shock, insertion of a tube uh, to open the patient's airway, and injection of a meta a medication into the heart. In extreme cases, open chest heart massage. By the way, these definitions themselves are right from uh, the state of New York. This is how your state uh, defines DNRs and CPR. Yeah. against a DNR because so a DNR relates their medical condition to mm -hmm. the patient was uh, drowned. So it wasn't heart failure that caused them to go and con cause their heart to stop, it was drowned. So then in that sense it's you had to I don't know. It was what do you do? Well, you had to resuscitate because it, they, their heart didn't stop because of their their condition. You bring up an interesting point. Uh, in the state of New York, uh, there is some immunity. If you're not DNRs. a medical personnel. No, 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 even if you are, I mean, in specific circumstances, I, I didn't write them all down, and it, it gets pretty technical. Um, you know, for one thing, if you see someone dying, right, and you're in the medical profession, um, you, you shouldn't ask them, you know, oh, do you have a DNR, right? You, know, you help them, right? Um, if it turns out they have a DNR, and that's somehow made aware, they maybe have a bracelet DNR, um, you know, then, then you, you don't do what you're called to do. But otherwise, yeah, you have to do. In, in some states, uh, to do nothing is, is uh, prohibited. Like I think in the state of, I want to say, uh, Michigan or Montana? I, mean, I, I think in Michigan, uh, the, no, no, it's definitely not Michigan. And there's a state uh, where there's a good Samaritan law that if you do nothing, if you just stand there and let someone die, like you, there, there's a fine. In some cases, they're fined. In other cases, there's actually sentencing that could occur. Yeah. I know as an EMT, we're not required to stop when we're not on the clock, like out and driving. Uh -huh. But our doctors, I think, because they take the, um, what, the Hippocratic um, oath. So are they, do, with that oath, do they have to stop if there's an accident or something? You know, I, I don't know the, the specifics, I don't legality so. of it. I don't think but so. I do know there are provisions with um, the Good Samaritan Law in this state. That would give the doctor immunity if he or she, you know, um, help the person. Let's say they see a car, they see you again, car wreck, you're on the ground. <laughs> doctor drives by. The poor bed, you know, the poor bed in there are, is, uh, you know, bleeding to death. Uh, the doctor goes in and you know, helps you. But you had a DNR. Um, that, that's nothing. He has immunity. So if you so if you go after him legally, um, nothing's going to happen. And just interesting enough, this is from the, the American Heart Association. And one of the facts they, they make, because I, 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 especially as the American Heart, Heart Association, there are a lot of people in this country that are a little afraid to help people out. They think they're having a heart attack because they're afraid they're going to get sued. And one fact they bring up is no lay person has, no lay person, that's also important, uh, has ever uh, been successfully sued for performing CPR in a victim of cardiac arrest. Half the plaintiffs CPR. What's that? Half the plaintiffs can't even properly do CPR. That's right, I have no idea. Yeah, you gotta break the ribs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh? You gotta break crazy. a couple ribs. Really? People can. Yeah. yeah. You gotta do it right unless you break ribs. I mean, I don't want you doing CPR on me. <laughs> Brandon, if I die, you can. If I'm having a heart attack, you're in charge. Okay. <laughs> uh, what would you guess the success rate of CPR? It's just. I am. Mean, that's completely answer. outside of my. Realm of expertise. I, I, I have no idea. It's, it's a good question. It's four percent. It's four percent, really. Four percent. 
four percent. In TV, it's seventy-five percent. They did a, they did a, a freaking out. But but is that considered? Is that taken into consideration? Professionals or lay people? Is that all they bought? I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, in general. Yeah. It's also given on people that shouldn't be given it. But in this state, if you see someone having a heart attack or, or on the ground, if you give them whatever CPR, uh, you are not breaking the law and you do have some form of immunity if they come back and try to sue you. It's called the Good Samaritan Law. Every state has some sort of Good Samaritan Law. Uh, this is just interesting to your own knowledge. Okay, these aren't required for hospice, but you might do this. Specifically, you know, part of hospice is, you know, um, you taking an active role in the dining process, and, and that may mean filling out a, a DNR. Uh, at the very least, filling out a living will. This is, this is a, a, a legal living will. This is, if you want to fill out a living will in the state of New York, you'd fill out this form. And just take a second to look at it, and you know, fill out your name there. And these, are, these would be the, the different types of uh, medical care that you would check off if you didn't want that to happen. So if you didn't want uh, a, a medical respirator to be used, you checked it off. Um, if you didn't want an abortion or sterilization to be used, you checked it off. I can't think of a case where that would happen. Um, if you didn't want you know, electric shock therapy, you checked it off, and et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole list of them. <laughs> uh, and then you, you would also, you need, you need witnesses to sign it, and then you would also have um, options for organ and tissue, tissue donation. So why do, why is hospice, and hospice um, is very, very important today, and if you don't know of it, you will, especially as your parents, my parents, uh, age, maybe the, remember that baby boomer generation, right? And the, that's where a population exploded. Well, that whole generation is getting very, very old. You know, they're, they're, they're now entering into um, hospice organizations, or they're entering into retirement homes, and they're going to be facing death soon, probably sooner than we are. Um, and that means there's a great need for this sort of service, right? That's probably one of the reasons why the healthcare industry is a great industry to get into, uh, especially if you want a job. So one of the first things they respond to is the nature and pain of dying. Caregivers didn't always realize or acknowledge the level of pain uh, and other forms of distress being experienced by individuals. I mean, it's usually said that you have no idea what it's like to die unless you died, or unless you're dying, right? You know, excessive amount of strain, psychological, spiritual, uh, physiolog physiological. And the goal is to make all caregivers, family, uh, friends, <coughs> nurses, whomever's involved, to be aware uh, of that. Uh, the need for end of life conversations. And we talked about this, especially in the, our first lecture. Uh, the goal is to involve the patient in their health care decisions as much as possible, which could again involve having them fill out a DNR. Uh, providing effective resources. So one thing is the hospice do very, uh, it's, it's a holistic form of care. And one thing it does very, very well is finding out what your needs are and then putting you in touch with people uh, that can help you with those needs. So if you, there's a spiritual need there, right? Um, you know, you want to have that conversation with your minister or with your priest or with your monk, and then they'll, 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 find, they'll help you make that connection. You can have those conversations. Um, they respond to the worry that wishes may be ignored. I mean, uh, unfortunately, sometimes we hear things like, your, your, can't, your pain can't be as bad as they say. Uh, we have to stay strong. Uh, you know, uh, we, have, we have to save the really strong medication when you really need it. You know, stuff like that. The, those types of ideas aren't very helpful. I mean, this is an individualized process and, and hospice helps uh, you to be a little more sensitive uh, to the needs of the dying. In terms of your paper, um, for some of you who are interested in this, it may be of, it, it might be a, a very good experience for you, especially those of you who are training to be nurses to interview a hospice nurse. You know, someone who, whose job is to do this day in, day out and hear what they have to say about their experiences. <coughs> Um, just of a hospice team, so again, a hospice team isn't simply the nurses. We think of the nurses, but we think of the hospice team is inclusive, and everyone um, who supports that patient is involved in some role. And a lot of times you see you know, a, a role blurring uh, between the nurses, volunteers, physicians, uh, home, home health care aides, um, bereavement counselors, spiritual counselors, therapists, and of course the family. And in terms of, so what are the 10 things hospice tries to do or the 10 things they stand for. Uh, first, 
even when there is um, a hospice facility, and there are hospice facilities, um, the focus, it, again, it, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophy. They don't consider themselves you know, a, a, a hospital. They consider, they consider themselves a, a, you know, a way of living to help you live to the best of your ability in your final days, final hours. Um, it affirms life, not death. This is, by the way, so these are the 10 principles that you'll find uh, in most hospice organizations. I believe they're universal. And this is one of the reasons why <coughs> hospice, although in, K, in situations like Oregon, where physician assisted suicide has been you know, legalized for over you know, uh, a decade, uh, they will respect the patient's decision to go through that process. Hospice will have nothing to do with it. If you choose to do that, they can't participate in that. Why? Because this is part of their core values. We affirm life, not death. Yeah. So I've been to a bunch of hospice facilities, and it's very different compared to a hospital. Because in a hospital, everyone's kind Talk of about, yeah. in denial that you're dying, and that's why they feel like alone, like in huh? Whereas in hospice, it's just everyone is on the same page that you're going to die. But it's very comforting that, like, that they recognize that it's not like the course on the table. Yeah. Thank you. And th that's kind of the whole point, because it, it's a context now where you can have these, you can openly have these discussions, right? You can ask those questions of, you know, what happens after death, or what's dying like? Um, which again empowers people. Um, it offers care uh, to the patient family unit, and so hospice doesn't just end when the uh, patient dies, uh, but it continues, you know, for uh, those who are, who are bereaved. Uh, and, and again, it, it's holistic care. It enhances the quality of life to the best of its abilities. Um, Charles Core, he talks about those four tasks. He's a big proponent of this. And if you do decide to do something on hospice for your final paper, you definitely want to check out what he has to say. He's a whole chapter on it. Just a few more principles. Uh, so we talked about the family members. Uh, we talked about how it's holistic and <coughs> encompassing uh, many skills. It's a program that's available, you know, 24/7. Uh, how they help each other, and it, it's usually uh, members who are coping with life-threatening illness. There's a myth, you know, that you know you have to be, you know, days away from your death to be in a hospice, and that, that's not the case. Um, to to <coughs> enter into a hospice you know, care um, organization, you have to be terminally ill, right? You know, if you have the flu, you can't you can't uh, um, you can't be a part of the hospice team if you have the flu or, or whatever. You have pneumonia in the hospital. You have to be terminally ill. Um, however, th there isn't, to my knowledge, a specific point in which you have to enter in. In fact, most hospice nurses would say the sooner you enter in to this care, the better it is for you, the family, and for the patient. Why? Because you're preparing yourselves. Uh, and, however, most people that enter into hospice generally do it at the very end of the dying process. Um, now let's just end with this. I mean, I just got by my home and I remember, you know, who was there. Working on process is... You know, I, 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 won't, I won't hold you for the video. Uh, but please, please, if you get a chance, if you're interested in this, uh, look it over on your own